All right then, if you have your Bibles, we'd ask you to turn to the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 9, and we're going to begin reading in verse 20. Mark chapter 9, beginning in uh, verse 20. The Bible says, And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the Spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oft times have cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I'd like to preach, the Lord be my helper tonight on the thought, Lord, help my unbelief. Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your watch care. Lord, we thank you for your mercy that you've given in our lives. Lord, we thank you for the breath of life, Lord, and your strength that even brought us this way tonight. Lord, we pray that you would bless your word uh, tonight, Lord, that you'd be faithful to it, that you take it into the hearts of those that are listening, Lord, that you might stir them up, Lord, to your service, Lord, that uh, we might believe, uh, we might understand how faithless we really are. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory for it, for it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, uh, as we begin, I want to say this, first of all, unbelief can cripple your Christian life. Now, we live in a day and age where uh, people, instead of having sinners, they call them non-believers. Well, that's not a sinner. A sinner is someone that's dead in their trespasses in sin, uh, who needs the intervention of God. That's a sinner. Uh, you can't be a non-believer if you've not been made alive. Unbelief is a problem in the church. It's a problem among the saved. Uh, lack of confidence in what God is able to do. And I believe that's a real problem that we have today is, uh, is limiting to what our God can do. Limiting what uh, He can accomplish and we do it by putting tags on everything. Do you believe God can still heal? I certainly do. I've seen it. I know it happens. But uh, we want to we wanna kind of box that in, don't we? Uh, can our God move mountains? Well, the Bible says it can. And, we, and I believe, I understand that there's progress in front of us. And sometimes there, there's a mountain of the devil before us. But I fully believe this and, and come to current terms with it. If, if God wanted to move the East Tennessee mountains and move them over somewhere else, He can do it. He, he's able to do that. That's the God we serve. But we live in a day and age today where unbelief has crippled God's people to the point we have no power in the churches. In verse 21, go back there, and he, meaning the father of the child, and he asked, and he asked his father, How long has it how long ago since this came unto him? Now what he was talking about, the it was a demon, a devil. Now be very careful when you listen to me. Demon possession is still a very real thing. Yeah. People don't see it and we write it off to other events. But if you are not sealed into the day of redemption, you can be demon possessed. And listen, Satan can... We'll see how he wreaked havoc in the life of this young man. But listen, don't look for people... Now there are some that are just troublemakers. They're there to cause problems. But some of the sweetest, nicest people you've ever thought about knowing may well be full of demons. What about Mary Magdalene's character? All we know is of whom seven demons were cast out. Did it ever say that Mary was a bad person? Did it ever say Mary Magdalene was a harlot? Didn't say any of those things. It says of whom seven demons were cast out or seven devils. And so I want you to see two things from that. Number one, praise be to our God. All that is under His feet. There's not one opposition that can come up against our God or against our Savior. I also want you to see that, it said that the answer of the Father was as of a child. Now, uh, does that not get rid of the thought of uh, a sinless child? You know, we're always taught this age of accountability. 
The only problem is nobody could ever tell me what that was. And the only problem with that, uh, nobody ever could say, well, when do you become accountable of your sins? No, nobody can answer that. The only thing I will say with that, and we'll move on, is David, the only one piece of Scripture, when David's son died, he says, he can't come to me, but I can go to him. That's the only indication whatsoever. So, uh, if there's an age of accountability, what is it? And if you will follow that trend of thought, you will find it right back in the Catholic Church. That's where that age of accountability comes from. So, just extra information for you tonight. But I do want you to see this was a child, and he was demon-possessed. He was devil-possessed. The devil reaped things in his body. Now, with that said, what does devils always like to do? They like to destroy. They like to upset. They like to cause problems. They like to burn. Our God is an orderly God. That's why He said that in, in 1 Corinthians 14, do ye everything decently in order. He's always been very orderly in the way He does things. So demons are there to mess up. Demons are there to disturb. Uh, demons are there to break the routine. That, 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 that's their, that, that is one thing that they do. And so we see that this young man... <laughs> this child was demon possessed. Verse 22, oft times it cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. Now, don't forget this. What the devil wants to do is destroy. He, he is called the destroyer. He is out there to bring us down. And it was his desire to take the life of this child as well. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Now, two things there. First of all, he asked of the Lord Jesus Christ, have compassion on us. Uh, in the Gospel, um, in the Epistle of Jude, I think it's verse 23, it says, of some, have compassion, making a difference. Now, the difference between love and compassion, because you know your new versions uh, will change that word around. There's a di difference between compassion and love. Did you know that? Love is just an affection. Compassion, you actually do something with it. If you love somebody, you will do certain things. You, you, you will go... If your love for the Lord Jesus Christ don't bring you to the house of God, there's something wrong. If your love for the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't get you out there and share the gospel, there's something wrong. That's not much love. Compassion is what's important. Uh, it will move you and motivate you to do more than the regular, more than the routine. And so as he comes before this man, he says, have compassion. In other words, love us with some kind of action and help us. Now, I want you to see that this man had been brought to rock bottom. Now, the problem is today, the Lord's people are prideful. Say what you will, the Lord's people are prideful. We were, uh, me and Brother Downs were talking before service time. And they're prideful over things that's not necessarily even in the Bible. But they're proud of what they've taught. You know what that is? It's Judaism. Uh, that's being a Pharisee. Is it not? They, they were prideful over how many times that they washed their hands throughout the meal. They were prideful in the things that they done. They were prideful in what they were accomplishing. This man was out of pride. He was done with it. And we need to get that back to that as a people. You want to see God do something? Get rid of your pride. You want to see God move? Get rid of your pride. You know, you know uh, uh, we, need, we need to set our, uh, our selfness aside and just do what well, the Lord would have us to do. And, and so we see that this man had come to the end of that point with his son. He just knew that he needed help that he didn't have in of himself. Verse 23, And Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible. Now, that's easy to read, harder to go with. Now you get that. If you believe, all things are are possible. And don't start boxing that up. All things are possible. Do you believe if, if the Lord God so wanted, we could arrive at New Testament Baptist Church and have a new wing out this way on uh, next Sunday morning? I believe it. I don't, I don't know how it would be possible, but I know we could do it. 
And so you say, well, that's foolish. Well, you're the one limiting your belief, not me. See, we, we, we've gotten so trapped by the world thinks we don't even know what belief is. We don't even know what faith and confidence is. You know what? The very same God that parted the Red Sea is the one we serve tonight. Is there anything my God can't do? And you know what you always hear? Well, this is the modern age. Well, funny thing to me, Malachi 3.6 says, I am the Lord, I change not. So if He did it then, we serve the very same God that parted the Red Sea. We, we serve the, the very same God uh, huh, that... Uh, it was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration. We, see the, we, we serve the very same God that wrote the law with His own finger in stone tablets. We serve Him. So what are we, where, did, where did this doubt begin? Well, obviously it's not a very, a very new trait, is it? Now, this, this man had one thing that we don't. He said... Straightway the father child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Now I believe. I just said I did. I know that it happened. He parted the Red Sea. He, uh, he did so many. He raised the dead. He raised one girl that had just died. He raised another one that was on the way to the cemetery. He raised Lazarus four days after landing in the grave. I believe that. But I have to say, help my unbelief. Because what does immediately come into our mind? Well, he don't work that way anymore. Right? Yeah, you're old. That's good. That was in the Bible time. That, you know, that was back then. But then you have to come back to Malachi 3.6. I am the Lord. I change not. So, if it was the will of God, and we weren't hampered by unbelief, could he not do it? Sure he could. Uh, I've seen miraculous things in my short ministry. I want to see more. And, and those of you that were here when the Lord helped us build this building. Well, I'll say this much. The Lord built this building. All the miraculous things that happened. Uh, a handful of people, maybe 20 of us. Uh, eight men. Uh, Adam and uh, Matthew were just boys. We, st we had the same money at the end that we started with in the beginning. And built a $50,000 building. And who knows what it might be worth. And started with this. Can my God do that? Sure He can. Amen. That's how He works. That's how He's always worked. But we see that it is hampered by our unbelief. Now, one more thing before we move on. You can turn to the Gospel of Matthew 17. People will also <laughs> say God is sovereign. And he most certainly is. He does what seemeth good unto himself. But don't blame your lack of faith on God's sovereignty. Did you get that? Don't blame your lack of faith on God's sovereignty. Because he does do it what seemeth good unto himself. But try your faith. Try your faith. Yeah. You know, uh... When you try something, you're testing it to see how far it will go. Brother Dow just headed back to Thailand. Uh, you know what? He don't have the support he did when we started out this thing seven or eight years ago. And you know what? You know what's bringing back to Thailand besides Nancy's visa? It's because he simply is going by faith. Amen. Right. Might be the last time we see him. You know what? Maybe not because nothing more than this. He can't afford to get back. But he's going in faith. You know, we always make plans, do we not? I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this. And then, when something interrupts, we start pushing and pushing and pushing. We want it our way. But where's the faith in that? You know what? <laughs> Balaam wanted to head on in the same direction too, didn't he? Had to get a sermon from an ass to know where it was wrong. He wanted to keep pushing, did he not? And, and so we see then that we are much the same way. We just need to be empowered by our faith. Empowered by our belief. Empowered by what we believe 
God can do. Matthew 17, verse 19. Matthew 17 and verse 19. The Bible says, Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could we not cast him out? Now, two things I want to show you. First of all, very similar sort of a very similar set of circumstances, but I do not think it was the same event. And I'll show you why in a few minutes. But I want you to see, first of all, you could tell they were good Baptists because they were embarrassed by something that they didn't address it in front of the crowd. They got to where they were by themselves. Lord, why couldn't we cast them out? Now, I also will say this. The apostolic office is dead. We don't have the ability to cast out demons, but we can go from before God that can. We, we, now, the problem is, <clears throat> when we lay it all out there, do we really believe God can do it? Now, our God can do that. He, he's the master of the sea. The demons are under His feet. He is above all and, and, in, and above everything that could be. But His apostles, ones that walked hand in hand with Him, they couldn't cast the demon out. They couldn't get rid of the devil. It, it was not responding. Notice what the Lord says in verse 20. And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, why is that New Testament growing? Now again, we want to blame God's sovereignty on everything. Well, the Lord just hasn't added anybody. You ever thought about it? Could be because of our unbelief. Right. Good. It could be our lack of confidence of the great God Jehovah. It could be our lack of confidence in Jesus Christ because what hindered them? It wasn't because the ability wasn't there. It was their unbelief. Has our God changed any ever? No, no, no. So it has to be back to us and our unbelief, our lack of faith. Uh, what did the Lord Jesus say? Oh, faithless generation. We don't need to be that. We're the Lord's people. We need to gain in confidence in Him instead of going back the other way. Because of your unbelief, for verily or truly I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove you hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible <laughs> unto you. Very, very powerful thing, isn't it? Now, there's two things we have to take from that. Number one, God can still do it. And number two, we have a measuring standard for our faith. And it's very, very embarrassing. Anybody ever planted mustard? I had one time in my whole life. And uh, it was so tiny and thin, the wind would catch it and blow it away. You had to be very, very careful. Um, it would have took, took 25 to fill up my fingernail. They were, they were the smallest seeds I ever, and you would just kind of push them into the ground. And it was beautiful mustard when it came up. It, 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 it was something to see, but it was probably the smallest. I don't even know that you could really see one good, just one by itself. And so he was saying to them, you don't even have that. He wasn't saying your faith is a grain of mustard seed. He says, if you had it, meaning they didn't, right? So if we have that kind of faith, we can do great things. We can, we can see the Lord Jesus Christ advance. And at the very, very least, we can say, let's meet with God every time we come together. Let's pray that God will come down and do something among us every time we meet. And He can and He will. He will. And so we see that uh, the apostles being a little bit upset about this thing, the Lord kind of rebuked them. Verse 21, another one that is hard for us, how be it, this kind goeth out, but by prayer and fasting. Number one, I want you to see that he says this kind, this type of devil, this kind type of demon, goeth out by, only by prayer and fasting. How long has it been since you really prayed? I mean, really prayed and got a hold of God. How long has it been since you prayed and you didn't intend to get up until you heard from God? 
That's prayer. And then fasting. Fasting on top of that. You know what? We need to be a people known by our fasting. When, when, when that, that obstacle gets in front of you, you drop down somewhere and you go to pray. You know what we need to do as God's people, and, and not that God don't know, but we need to define our problems very specifically. And then once we have the problem worked out, because you know most of the time we don't even know the problem ourselves. But once we define that problem and see what the obstacle is, then we can begin to pray, Lord, move it. Get this away from me. Get, get this out. Move it, if you would, and truly pray about it. And He's certainly faithful to do that. We need to learn to fast and to pray. Gospel of Mark chapter 16. Mark 16 and verse 14. This is following the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Mark 16 and verse 14. The Bible says, Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as he sat at mead. Now let me say with this, when it says that there is significance in saying that they were eating because they were locked up on the inside. Uh, the doors were bound, and he came. And in Matthew's gospel, it says he came walking. You know, he walked through the wall. Peace be unto you. Now, do you think he still does that? Certainly, he does. So wouldn't we wouldn't be like Elisha and his servant, and, and, and our eyes just for a moment might can see the spiritual things that are going about around us even now. And what did he say? Uh, I believe it was to the church at Thyatira. I know where Satan's seat is at. That means he showed up. You know what? Sometimes I think the devil's imps are is the most faithful people that come in. You don't have to worry them missing Wednesday night or Sunday. You know, because listen, they're going to be there. That's a shame and a disgrace to us that the devil's counterparts are more faithful than we are. And so we see then that these, uh, we see that he came through, he was a spiritual being, he came in, and he upbraided them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. Now, those two always accompany one another. I want you to see, first of all, he upbraided them or corrected them huh, for their unbelief. Now, were they all saved folks? I think they were. Thomas was out of the, I mean, excuse me, Judas was out of the picture now. I believe he had his 11 apostles that were the real deal. And he upbraided them for their unbelief. Now, what we need today is be upbraided for our unbelief. When, when we say, oh, that's what, it was, that's what it said to the church back then. But in the modern day, you can't take it just like that. You know what that is? That's, that's unbelief. That's saying, hey, this ain't true. Uh, the, the, this is not, it, it says, that, you know, I, I've heard people even say this from people. That's what it says, but it's not what it means. Then why does it say that? Why is it presented that way? That's not what it means. I, you know, they always say that and I never can quite understand it because they don't give any explanation on it. But I will say this. Believers, well, I'll say this. The redeemed can have a problem with unbelief. The redeemed can have a problem with unbelief. And I know I do. And so we see then, we see then that they were upbringing for their unbelief. And then what's the next one? And the hardness of their hearts. So, you know, I have a pretty simple Stuart County mind. And it looks up like to me the unbelief preludes the hardness of heart. In other words, if we keep being unbelieving and keep saying, Oh my God, can't do that. Oh, that was back in Bible times. Oh, that was before this and before that. We'll eventually get hard hearted to Hear a lot of people say, oh, I wish it could be back it was in the 70s. I wish it could be like it was in the 1960s. Well, you know what the problem between then and now is? Hardness of heart. And it's not just out there. It's right in here too. You know, I would love to see a great revival among God's people. 
But it's not going to happen with a bunch of hard-hearted people not even really praying anymore. Just going through a routine. Just going through a little one, two, three, and voila. Uh, prayer's not like that. Uh, prayer can't be preempted that way. Go, go over to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14. I personally believe Paul would be the writer in writing to the first church at Jerusalem. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Now, Baptists typically don't like if statements. But this body, this Bible is full of if statements. The reason we don't like them, we want to blame God's sovereignty and everything on grace. That makes us that we don't have any, any responsibility, right? But I want you to see the text of this. It, it, it's very, very clear. For we, for it, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Now let me tell you that in very easy terms. In other words, if, if you're not steady, there's no reason to believe that you've been born again. You know who people I have confidence in? I've preached a lot of funerals, and the ones I have confidence when we lay them in that ground is the ones that been steadfast to the end. And we about got so far as Baptists, they can live like a dog from one person to the next person and be a pothead and a smoker and a drinker. And when they when they come down, some little uh, first start, little pastor come up, oh, he made a profession in, in 1962. Well, so what? What's happened since 62? Good. We, we, we need, and so we do see a big if statement. And he says in verse 15, while it is said to, today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. So we can't harden our hearts. For some, when they had heard, did, did provoke, albeit not all of them that came out of Egypt by Moses. Now I will say this, he said they all did harden the heart that came of Moses, Moses but most of them did. You know how many didn't get hard hearted? Two. The rest of them died, did they not? We had two that came out. And you know, everybody gets, oh, well, you know, it's such a bad day. You don't see nobody in church. Well, can you imagine out of four and a half million people, two make it to the other side? And I know there were some children, but of those that left, two adults made it, Caleb and Joshua. The rest of them died in the trip. And so we see then, it would require us to look at our faith and see what, to see what our faith does for us, to see what our faith makes us do. Verse 17, but with whom was he grieved 40 years? The ones that died, the ones that did not make it, the ones that were rebellious. For with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter unto the rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter because of unbelief. So unbelief is going to impact us. You know, it never ceases to amaze me how people that claim to be Christians doubt our God. We, we, we look for steadiness in everything but the author of it. We look in social security. We look in jobs. And listen, that, that, that's about to wind up. We're down to Trump and Clinton. That's like cho choosing between Ahab and Jezebel. Well, what are we going to do? Well, it's time that you set your mind to a different thinking. And you know what? <laughs> This right here is fixing not to be worth a whole lot. Mark my words, church. It's going to be, it's going to be very soon that you will take a chip or you'll go without money. You remember I told you that. Because it's coming. It's coming very, very quickly. And, and so we see then that huh, 
Why did they get in the situation they were? Why only two made it? Because of unbelief. So, in summation, what do you really believe in? Where is your confidence laid tonight? Now, spiritual confidence laid on the mercy seat before the Lord Jesus Christ is an easy thing. Why is it so difficult for the carnal? Well, I believe it was Paul wrote for the carnal mind is enmity against God. But we never we, we need to get down to the point where we're starting to have more confidence back in the God we claim to serve. The one that parted the Red Sea. The one that was give Peter the ability to walk on the water and go to the Lord. You need, you need to begin to have confidence. Can can the Lord bring the great revival? You bet he can. But we've got to believe. We need to quit doubting. We need to get inside, quit saying, well, that was the old age. No, no, we, we need to begin just to trust. Last place, Gospel of Mark, chapter 11. Just one verse. Mark 11, and verse 23. The Bible says, For verily or truly say I unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith that he saith. Therefore say unto you, What things soever ye desire, when you pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Now I've seen that spiritualized from here to Clarksville. But you know what? I believe it's real. Now I will say this, because the Bible says it in a very near scripture. He does know what's good for us. And I'm not saying, Oh Lord, please send me a million dollars and jump it up and money for a million dollars. But I do believe this. Every man that God ever sustained, He did it one day at a time. Amen. Do you ever think about that? In fact, Elijah only got one meal at a time. He got one in the morning, one in the evening. The Hebrew journeyers got one meal a day. I mean, they, they received it in the morning, and they ate it, and they got some the next morning. And they were able to gather enough just for the day. So I'm not saying that you're going to be wealthy. I'm not saying you're going to be billionaires. But I am telling you to put your faith and confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why would you trust Him with your soul and not trust Him with your life? It's good. <coughs> Too hardy thinking, is it not? I believe He can still do what He's always done. Jesus.